Good morning, everybody. It's good to see you all. Merry Christmas and welcome. Good to be together again. Thank you for the choir and Liz and those that stepped in at the last moment because Dan got ill on us and we're praying he's going to feel better soon as well. And for Pastor Glenn for taking up a lot of the work this morning as well. Thank you. Um, we're continuing our Advent series this morning. We're going to be looking at Isaiah chapter 9. So if you have a Bible, you feel, feel free to turn to that. Or, of course, you can follow along on the screens behind me. Isaiah prophesied about 725 years before Christ was born at a time when Israel and Judah had been conquered and crushed by the Assyrians. Now, in spite of their rebellion that brought all this about, God was and he is always faithful to his covenant. And Isaiah reminds the people of God of the unchanging truth that darkness will not have the final say. Now, in this passage we're going to look at this morning, we're going to see Isaiah prophesying about the two advents that Pastor Glenn preached about last week. So let's begin this morning. We're going to look at Isaiah chapter 9, beginning at verse 1. Nevertheless, there will be no more gloom for those who are in distress. In the past, he humbled the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali, but in the future, he will honor Galilee of the Gentiles by the way of the sea along the Jordan. The people walking in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in the land of the shadow of death, a light has dawned. Let's skip down to verse 6. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace there will be no end. He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness from that time on and forever. The zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. The grass withers and the flowers fall, but the words of our Lord stand forever. Our Father in heaven, this morning as we think about this wonderful prophecy written so many years ago before Christ was even born, speaking very clearly about him, we pray, O oh Lord, that the light of Christ would dawn in our hearts afresh and anew this day. That light would just grip our hearts and our souls to the point it would change us. That that light then might pour out of us and into the darkness around us. We praise you and thank you and ask you to bless the preaching and the hearing of your word for Christ's sake. Amen. I walk early in the morning every day, almost every day, and I pray. It's a really special time for me. It's a quiet time. It's a very peaceful time. It's a time of real sweet fellowship with the Lord and now that it gets it's so dark in the mornings until later I start walking before usually before it's light so I get to see the sun come up and I love that time of the day but one of the things I love about it most is the dawn and what I like about the dawn is how the dawn doesn't rush in at you it it kind of just creeps in a little at a time until the darkest part of the night is given way to the light Isaiah prophesies about a dawning in this passage, a creeping, if you would, of light into the gloom and the darkness of a broken world. And he understood that very well because the people of God were living in extraordinary darkness in his day, the darkness of war and captivity. Now we know he was predicting the coming of the Messiah, who is indeed Jesus Christ, the light of the world whose birth, the first advent, we celebrate at Christmas. The first advent is the dawning. And as bright as his light shined as he walked on the face of the earth, indeed, he was the light of the world. His second advent will be a complete bursting forth of light when there will be no more darkness ever. Isaiah speaks of both of these things, both of these events. So the Christmas story is a story of dawning, the tiny light of new birth pitted against massive darkness. Now, none of us like darkness. We have to remember, unless there's first darkness, there's really no need for light. But it's in the darkest times we see God's clearest provision of light 
in his son in whom we see the power and the person and the promise of light in this passage. And that's what I want us to think about for just a bit this morning. First, how in Christ we see the power of of light. Now, when Isaiah prophesied, the nation was in ruin, everything had been destroyed, and those who had not been killed were taken into captivity, deported to a land far away. The temple, the light of the temple, the light of the priesthood had been extinguished. Zebulun and Naphtali, these are of the northernmost tribes of Israel. They were the first to suffer and fall to the Assyrians. And their fall marked the beginning of some of the darkest days in Israel's history. And yet, God is gracious, even to his rebellious people, and he had a plan. His plan was to powerfully shine his light into the darkness. Light's come a long way, hadn't it, from its origin. Whenever it was discovered, this little flame And now it is used powerfully in a myriad of ways, in industry, in medicine, in the military, as energy to heat and cook, to transmit data, to look into places the human eye can't see and into the deep recesses of space. Light is a powerful tool in our world. It is used in many, many ways. And still, at its very essence, the power of light is its ability to overcome the darkness. I want you to think about a time in your life, a time when great struggle overwhelmed you, a difficult time, a time when darkness may have obscured everything. You couldn't think straight, talk straight, relate well. Think about that time. Now think for a minute about during that time, how somehow someone spoke something to you or did something for you and you got just a little tiny bit of joy, of comfort, of hope. That's the power of God's light when it penetrates into a life of someone who's hurting. While Jesus' ministry is one of mercy to those in distress... More importantly, his ministry is to shine the light of his truth and his love into the spiritual darkness of people's hearts. I mean, we are constantly reminded of the monumental problems we face in this world. I mean, all around us there is evil, there is terrorism, there is suffering, there is displacement, the likes of which human history hasn't seen And we know that all these things are really symptoms of a deeper, more fundamental problem. They're symptoms of hearts that are out of line with the Lord, hearts that are broken, hearts that are focused on self rather than the Lord. The essence of the light of Christ is his power to triumph over the spiritual darkness of people's hearts. Stronger economies, new democracies, better living conditions and jobs and educations, affordable health care and welfare, these are all good things, but not one of them will solve the problems of, of our world because they don't deal with the root problem. We need the light of Christ shined into our hearts if we're going to ever be able to truly see the problem, which is sin, and the solution, which is Christ. That's why he came. But there's another aspect of the power of light in Christ that I don't want us to miss, especially during the holiday season. We know Christ is the light of the world, but if you remember, he said, you are the light of the world. In Christ, we carry the very presence of God with us, and that presence is his life. You see... When the Spirit of Christ came into our hearts and made us alive, His light drove out the darkness from us. And so, everywhere we go, we are revelations, we are testimonies of that freedom. 
Christmas is a time we have this extraordinary opportunity to let that light shine. Someone in your life is in bondage. Maybe it's you. Someone needs to know about the freedom that Christ offers when he shines his light into a person's heart and drives out the darkness. He doesn't promise to fix everything. He promises to fix the big thing. You see, just as every young child cries out in the night for a light that will take away the fear of darkness, every human heart longs for the light of love, every human mind searches for the light of truth, and every human spirit cries out for the light of hope in the middle of darkness. And the power of that light is found in Christ and by extension in His people. You and I have it if you're in Christ. And it's a powerful thing, y'all. Power of light. Secondly, I want us to see in this passage in Christ, we see the person of light. Now, when Isaiah prophesied, he was telling God's people about the coming of a Messiah, a baby boy who would be born and in some way he would honor Galilee of the Gentiles. But who is this child? Well, his offices and titles give us the answer. First, his office is the office of a king. A government being on his shoulders speaks of one who rules with authority, one whose kingdom is characterized by righteousness and justice. His titles give us even more answers. The first thing we're told is that he will be a wonderful counselor. Wonderful speaks of one who is exceptional, one who is beautiful, one who is without equal. Counselor speaks of one who comes at just the right time with just the right advice. And the Hebrew word for counselor here is also translated a military strategist. So here's one it speaks of who comes with the ability to wage and win war strategically, powerfully. That ties in perfectly with the next name, Mighty God, El Gabor. Literally, God is a mighty warrior. He comes with divine power, not just with might, but with invincibility to defeat every enemy we have. We're told he is an everlasting father. Speaks of his tender, loving care, his faithfulness to provide for, to protect his children. And last, we're told he is the Prince of Peace, one who brings security by removing every peace-disturbing power around us. And this is what I love about this passage. This one, this child, this son is to us, given to us. Emmanuel, you will call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us, God for us, God to us. But how do we know that this passage is about Jesus and any of the other messianic prophecies that we read in the Old Testament? Well, Isaiah chapter 9 has two of the 20 messianic prophecies found in the book of Isaiah. These 20 are among the 108 prophecies that Jesus fulfilled directly. Now there's another 160 some odd in addition to these that Jesus fulfilled indirectly, but there's 108 that he fulfilled directly. Now let me put that into perspective for you. I was reading a book on prophecy this week. Years ago, a very well-respected mathematician once calculated the odds of Jesus fulfilling just eight of the 108 messianic prophecies about him. And here's the number. Now, anybody knows me know I'm horrible at math, so I can't tell you what that number is even called. I know it's real big. The mathematician tried to illustrate it by saying it by by this way. He said, if you had this many silver dollars, you could fill up an area the size of Texas two feet deep. 
Now, he said, imagine if you took one of those silver dollars and you put an X on it, a black X on it, and you included it in the rest of these coins. And then you asked a blindfolded man to go in there and select one. The odds that he would select the one would be the same odds as Jesus fulfilling eight of these 108 messianic prophecies. But he didn't just fulfill eight of them. He fulfilled all 108 of them. This passage and others like it are about Jesus. Everything in the Old Testament points forward to Christ. It's all about him. And that's why the gospel is such good news. If you look closely at the life of Jesus, he's not just a king. He's the king of kings as Glenn preached about last week. He's a wonderful counselor before whom we can approach his throne of grace and find grace and mercy and help in our time of need. He is a mighty God whose kingdom has no end, who came the first time not with weapons of war, but with spiritual weapons, sacrifice, reconciliation, hope. But make no mistake about it, he will return as a mighty warrior king. And once and for all, he will crush every enemy we have. Satan, sin, and death. He is an everlasting Father. He and the Father are one, and he is, the, he is the profound representation of peace. This is all about Jesus. He fulfills every one of these offices and these titles perfectly. But there's more here. Not only do we see Christ fulfilling these prophecies by way of his office and his name, we see something else in this passage. We see a picture of the Trinity here. The Father, the Son who is the Prince of Peace, and the Holy Spirit who is the Counselor. So when you see that little baby in a manger, you see the entire Trinity standing behind this person of life. So my question for you this morning is where in your life today do you need a wonderful counselor to lead you and to guide you? Where do you need to know the tender, loving care of a father who never leaves or forsakes, who is always ready, who always does the right thing, who always loves his children well? Where do you need a mighty God, a warrior king who will come and defend you in the spiritual warfare of your life? who will destroy the enemies who come against you? And where do you need a Prince of Peace to overcome your fear and your anxiety? Where do you need that today? It's all found in Christ. All you have to do is ask Him. But here's the thing. It's the height of presumption to ask Him when you don't have a personal relationship with Him. I've said it before and I'll say it again. Jesus Christ will not be your cosmic Santa Claus. But he will be your Savior and he will be your friend if you ask him into your heart. See, the question is not really that people can't believe. It's that they won't believe. So what about you this morning? If you're here this morning and you don't have a personal relationship with Christ, I'm so glad you're here. I welcome you in his name, but I want to ask you this really important question this morning. What are you going to do with Jesus this Christmas? You're going to look at him in all these nativity scenes around, kind of reminisce about past Christmases and joy and family, all good stuff. And then maybe put him away at the end of the Christmas season, kind of like you do your Christmas decorations. Or will you receive him this year as a king? As a wonderful counselor, a mighty God, an everlasting father, a prince of peace. If you receive him in that as he is, not only will he change your life, not only will his light flood into your heart, it will be the best Christmas gift you ever got. The power of light and the person of light. Finally, in this passage, I want us to see in Christ, we see the promise of light. Now, there are two promises that were prophesied here by Isaiah that have been literally fulfilled in Christ. 
The first, of course, is this child, this baby boy would be born. The second is that this one would honor the Galilee, honor the land of Galilee. Jesus' mother and father came from Galilee. Jesus' earthly ministry started in Galilee. Almost his entire adult life was spent in Galilee. I'm not sure you could honor a place more than the Savior living and working in that place his whole life. But there are other promises here that will not be fully fulfilled until Christ returns, until the second advent takes place. One of them, of course, is an increase of his government and peace without end. He's talking about an eternal kingdom where perfect justice and righteousness reign, where there will be no more darkness and sin, no more suffering, no more brokenness, no more terrorism. Man, don't we long for that. It's going to happen. The second thing here, though, the promise to the end of the fear of death. The people of God in Isaiah's time, they were literally living in the land of the shadow of death. The Assyrians were a brutal and ruthless people. They killed with impunity. They didn't care. Men, women, children, babies, it made no difference to them. God's people lived in constant fear that they would be next. The promise of God was that light would not only overcome the darkness of gloom and despair, but more importantly, it would overcome the darkness of the fear of death. And that is something that every human being longs for, is to have the fear of death taken away from us. And that's exactly what the Lord has promised to do, to take away fear of death. There's a great old story told, and I love this story, set many, many years ago of a traveler who was going home for Christmas. And he came to a river where there was no bridge and it was winter. The water was frozen. Night was falling. He had to get across that river before it got dark. So cautiously stepped out on the ice. Then he got down on his hands and knees and he began to crawl inch by inch. Every movement terrified that that ice was going to break through and he was going to drown and he was going to die. He got about halfway across that river And he heard a noise. And out of the woods came another man driving a heavily loaded sleigh pulled by two horses. He was singing, joy to the world. And he came out of those woods and he went across that river. And here was this traveler on his hands and knees trembling with fear of death. And here was this other fella with horse and sleigh, singing this song of life, upheld by the very same ice upon which he was creeping. And i tell you why I like that story, because it says something very profound about God's promises. Even though God has promised all of His people eternal life in Jesus Christ, He has promised us an everlasting kingdom of justice and righteousness that will have no end. He has promised a time and a place where there'll be no more darkness, no more sin, no more suffering, no more crying, no more tears, no more pain. He has promised these things to us. But how many of us are like that traveler, fearfully creeping upon his promises as though the lightness of our step might make them more secure? Beloved, we are not to treat God's promises as though they were too fragile to hold us up. We are to stand upon them confident that God, He will do what He has promised to do. He is faithful. Not one of the good Lord's promises has ever failed. Not even one, the Bible says. But I know what you're thinking. How can we be sure? How can we be sure that God is faithful to His promises? Well, I think Isaiah anticipates that question and he answers it. The zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. 
Now, this is an interesting word, this word for zeal. It's also translated jealousy. Literally, it means to be deep red. Jealous zeal is the fire of God's love that burns deep red, and it contends for the object of his love against anything that would come against it. And in Christ, we see that zealous fire that not only burns deep red for us, it bled deep red for us. You see, not only do we have the manger, we got the cross and we got the empty tomb. And because we have those things, we can have absolute confidence, even in the worst of darkness, that God is faithful to his promises. He will overcome the darkness. 200 years ago, a Frenchman by the name of Louis Daguerre invented, developed the first photograph as he watched that image began to take shape. He said it was like a dawning. But then as the image came into full view, he cried out, I have seized the light. Christians have another cry. The light has seized me. If you're in Christ, it's not because you have seized him. It's because he has seized you. And if he has seized you, he will never let you go. You can have complete assurance. He will do what he has faithfully promised to do. May the light of this unchanging truth dawn in you as your joy and your hope. Not only in this Advent season as we celebrate the birth of Christ, but as we anticipate his second, his triumphant return. And may you rest in the power and the person and the promises of Christ's light. Remembering this truth, it's in darkest times that we see God's clearest provision of light in His Son. And here's our assignment for the week. Commit this week to share with at least one person the light of Christ's love His truth and your hope. And see if he won't honor you in that. See if he won't bless you in that and bring himself glory. Let's pray together. Our Father in heaven, we praise you and thank you that the prophets of old spoke so clearly about this Messiah who would come, this one whose light would dawn upon the darkness of this earth to bring hope, to bring salvation. Christ Jesus has come. He is indeed the light of the world. And wherever he shines his light, hope breaks out. Oh Lord, let the light of Christ dawn in us afresh over this Christmas season. But don't let us simply stop with Christmas, Lord. Let us look for his light in the world around us, in the things we do, the people we come in contact, and let us be the light of Christ so that wherever we go, we are witnesses and testimonies to our Savior. Thank you indeed for the light we have in Christ. For it's in his name we pray. Amen.